Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. As many of us approach midlife, especially women out there, we try to find ways to define the odds of aging, try to maintain that verb beauty and that stamina that we once had when we were young. Trying to find all those things in a synthetic way, though, we find out that's just a shallow cause. It isn't going to take us quite the way that we want to go, especially something that's going to be sustainable. Today we're going to take a symbolic journey through the 28 days of female hormonal experience. I know as a man you think, well, how is he going to be able to pull this off? Well, that's why we bring guests on, so they can help us do that. And joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is social healer and entrepreneur who has been tracking her cycles since 1998. And her aim is to change the world and how they view women by changing the way how women view themselves. Produced a fantastic book called Four Seasons in Four Weeks. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program our guest, Suzanne Mathis McQueen. Suzanne, how are you today? I'm great, Daniel. Thanks so much for having me today. You bet. Now tell us how you came to create Four Seasons in Four Weeks. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that um, actually I fell into it in sort of an unlikely way. I had decided back in the late 90s to track my cycle um, for a few different reasons. But um, the reason why that was kind of unusual is because I just really never felt that my hormones had anything to do with what made me tick. I didn't really like the way that society viewed women um, in regard to our hormones. And I didn't have a wacky cycle to begin with anyway. But um, there were just a few uh, things going on with me physically and um, all that kind of thing where I thought, you know, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and just track and kind of see what I think. And so I tracked my physical energy and my mental viewpoint, um, my sexual energy, uh, all those kinds of things, my communication abilities, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, what I ended up discovering just completely astonished me. Mm-hmm. I just really ended up discovering that we have this navigational system within us, and it's not something that... Um, Uh, what I eventually discovered by talking to other friends and all that too and then eventually seeing this myself is that it's not a it's not a a cycle or a rhythm or a pattern or a navigational system that goes away at menopause either it just becomes a little more subtle but in many ways it becomes more powerful Mm -hmm. now you've obviously created this book because you want to be able to help women uh, achieve peak performance in business athletics uh, sharpen decision making a lot of those things that, as you just alluded to earlier, that a society like ours tends to say, well, it's hormonal. That's why you're off whack. And you're saying, well, that's not true. Why are we right. buying into that? Right, right, right. Well, we're buying into the, Well, that gets into a lot of history. I mean, you know, really, if you, if you really want to get into it, I mean, this comes down to something that I believe the way that our 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 hormones, our navigational system within us, are meant to work. I think this is something that we understood a long, long, long time ago, thousands of years ago as women, um, when they cycled by the moon, before artificial lighting and that kind of thing, when women really had their circles going, and when women were really empowered around their bodies. And I will say that once patriarchy came in, in its many forms, over time, um, eventually all of that power and knowing fell by the wayside, and we began to take on um, the men's rhythm because there really wasn't any choice in the matter. We, we, we really started living in a man's world, and the men have a different, a different natural rhythm because their hormones are different. Um, and so that, that's, just, that's, the, that's the quick answer to that. But at this point in time, it's really time for us to step back now and see beyond just the scientific landscape of the hormones, which are completely accurate. It's just that there's also more to it. We also have a daily experience. There's primal wisdom that we can bring out of it, and there's just a bigger picture that we can, that we can now, um, uh, the way that we can view the whole thing and what we can gain from it is, is much bigger, is much bigger now. Mm-hmm. So as you uh, talk with uh, people about your book, women especially, and you hold workshops and events, things like that, how do you get them to see that we that they have bought into something that really doesn't serve well, like we were talking about earlier, while well, it's all in the hormones? Mm-hmm. You're saying, no, wait a minute. And to get them to see as they go through this process that it is well beyond that, that you're more empowered than you can ever imagine. 
Yeah, it doesn't take long at all. Because when I start talking about it, women recognize it immediately. And because really they do recognize that what they've been buying into, what they believe, um, doesn't feel good, doesn't feel right, doesn't feel natural, doesn't feel in alignment. It makes them feel ill, actually. And when I talk about what's really happening, how they can view this differently, it resonates. And I've got, I've got emails from all over the world telling me this. I've got women calling me and crying and saying, oh, my gosh, why didn't I learn this when I was younger? Um, you know, that kind of thing. So um, this is... Um, this is just something that's, that's so easy to understand, and it's also something that men really understand as well. Mm-hmm. You know, just recently, Suzanne, I was doing an interview on, it was called the uh, Pelvic Something of Steel. <laughs> <laughs> and this woman was fascinating because I'd never heard of anything like this before. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> and uh, you really should get a chance. Uh, you can find that interview. I think it's on our 50 Beyond channel. But okay. she uh, started getting getting real juicy and talking about the female anatomy, especially the fact that women have, and, and this really was interesting as she elaborated on it, more erection uh, muscle tissue than men do, and it's stronger. <laughs> you know, and I was like, really? And so she went in to say, you know, when the pelvis, you know, is kind of out of whack, that a lot of these things get blocked, and in the cases of women, some of their organs actually drop down into that area, and then they have, you know, a lot of problems with, uh, you know, going to the bathroom, so to speak. Maybe they can't control it, whatever the case is, and so, you know, things like sex and even the desire for it becomes to a point where they just don't. And that if they could just correct this and get a pelvic bowl of steel, that's what it was, that it changes everything, you know. And and I can see how what she's talking about, because she wasn't talking about hormones either, Mm -hmm. uh, and that what you're talking about kind of can be almost one and the same in a very unique way. Yeah, well, I I bet I know what she is talking about. I mean, there are... um, there is one particular shaman down in Belize who is no longer um, living, but he's passed the, the work on to another woman, um, Rosita Argivo, who has developed a, um, a pelvic and abdominal um, basic womb massage um, because this, this guy, this elder who was this shaman, and he died at 103 years old, um, he believed that the first thing that was wrong, if there was something wrong with a woman physically, he felt it was something was up with her womb, that it was not positioned correctly. And he would get in there and he'd actually move it and put it into position, mm-hmm. and she would get better. Um, you know, that you can't speak to um, uh, someone who's had their uterus removed or something like that. But anyway, it's fascinating work, and I think that it's only the beginning of what we're really learning about the female anatomy, not only physically, but how that affects everything energetically and how our bodies are wired as females and, and how that affects us mentally and emotionally and everything else. Um, and again, since we haven't really been able to access that, we were cut off from that for so long, for so long that we've really, it's, it's really as if we lost our language and our culture in a way. And now we're just starting to get that back. And when we start learning that again, everything starts falling into alignment. Mm-hmm. In my case, I am talking about the hormones. I'm just talking about a, um, I'm talking about a broader view of it. I'm talking about a mind, body, spirit aspect. Or in other words, I'm talking about the science of the hormones, um, uh, and in addition to that, I'm talking about the psychological journey and the wisdom that comes out of this primal engine that's running at all times with or without us. Um, you know, in school, we learn the, the biological hormones. So we can Google them really easily, and what you'll find are things that will tell us about the eggs building and the follicular stage and the luteal phase and all of this. But, you know, and, and that's, a, that's ac- um, absolutely accurate. It's just that, again... That doesn't mean anything to the everyday woman who's going on with her life and making decisions. You know, we need more information than that. And what I get into is really um, uh, what this means in a practical way, and also as, as well as for our partners. Now let's talk about the title of your book is Four Seasons in Four Weeks. Is that more or less literal? I mean, were you – because I've looked through and read through the book and – it's really very colorful, very artistically, you know, eye-catching. But 
also very insightful about what you talk about when you kind of, my feeling as I was reading through it is that that's what you do is to help people to reconnect to their natural biorhythms. And that's a little bit different for everybody, isn't it? Well, no, not necessarily. Oh, it isn't? Okay. Uh, well, it is in a unique way, absolutely. I mean, every sure. single person, every person on the planet is different. Everybody's got their own issues going on, and and everything we do affects our hormones or the different chemical, um, you know, the, the different chemical layout in each of our bodies. But it, it, as a broad template, no, we're really not all that different. For instance, um, let me explain it this way. Um, what every every cycle in the universe has something that looks like um, uh, this basic layout. It's got a resting phase, a building phase, an expression phase, and a deconstructing phase, and back to rest. And we all as humans have that same, those same four phases. Again, this is a real basic layout. So all of us, men and women both, have a 24-hour circadian rhythm. We have a 24-hour body clock. And we can see it by the fact that we sleep at night. That's our resting phase. We get up in the morning and our organs start waking up and our blood starts moving a little bit more, and that's our building phase. At some point, we peak in the, in the afternoon, and then at night, we wind back down. And that would be the deconstructing phase. And maybe we do that cycle a couple, two or three times during the day because maybe we take a nap or something like that. But what we, um, what we end up finding is that um, we are rhythmic thinkers. We don't think anything about it because this is so natural for us. And what I mean by that is that we, um, we generally um, choose to have coffee at certain times of the day and not others. We make heavy decisions at certain times of the day and, have, and, and not others. At night, maybe we decide that we will uh, sleep on it. You know, we'll, we'll, a topic will come up and we'll sleep on it. Um, there are different times that we, we just do um, creative work and other times that we do physical labor. You know, when we work out, we make decisions not only around our work schedules, but we, we, we make decisions based on our energy and that kind of thing. And men and women both do that, and we don't think it's crazy. We don't think that we're changing our minds a lot. We don't say that we're being emotional. You know, it, none of that. I mean, it, it's perfectly normal stuff. And the thing is, is that women have these same four phases in a month's time. And the reason they have those same four phases in a month's time is that during their cycling years, they are construction zones. They are building a uterine nest in order to prepare for a pregnancy should a woman desire one. And if no pregnancy happens, that uterine nest has to come down. And then it gets purged out in the form of the period later. So in that month's time, you've got this building of the uterus and this deconstructing of the uterus. And if you think about this, Daniel, I mean, this is super duper radical stuff for a body to go through every single month. And not only every single month, but every single day, it's adjusting a little bit. Mm -hmm. No different than how we look at the moon faces. Um, it, it, it follows that lunar rhythm. And then men would have those same four phases. What researchers are finding is that men have those same four phases in a year's time. So in other words, um, uh, like the seasons. And you, you personally may not follow exactly the four seasons, but you would have your own four seasons. So every mm -hmm. uh, three months or every 90 days, you'd have what would be thought of as more of a resting phase. And that's when your best ideas are coming in. You're sort of ruminating over lots of ideas that you have going on. You're just feeling kind of creative and, and really in your head. And then the next three months, the next 90 days, would be the building phase where you're acting on those ideas. Maybe you're building a business. Maybe you're building a relationship. Um, you know, you're taking action on things. And the following three months after that, the next set um, of 90 days, you would be in your full expression. You know, now your business or whatever it is is, a working machine, you're feeling great about it, maybe that relationship is going strong, you're all in love, everything's great. And then you hit the next phase, the fourth phase, which is the deconstructing phase. And what that means is that you've come upon some problems. You know, you, you start looking at things that, um, that are working well and things that aren't working so well. You have to go back to the drawing board on a couple of things. You may go through some depression. You may lose some direction, um, although that could happen in any of the phases. And then you're back to rest again. And what happens with all of us, so in this way, men would follow the sun and women are following the moon. 
you know, that is sort of our, our, our natural primal rhythm mm-hmm. is for women to be lunar rhythmic and men to be solar rhythmic. Um, so, so what this does is that when we aren't noticing that, when we're really not paying attention to being in alignment with that, um, things can, can – uh, it, it's almost as if we're, we're swimming upstream a little bit. It's as if things aren't going well for us when really if we would just tap into those energies and understand which phase we're in and align with that, we have better understanding. And when we understand more about ourselves, we're much more forgiving and, um, you know, we kind of go with the flow and we know that we're going to be in the next phase pretty soon or we know which tools to bring in. And does it also help, too, to feel like you're not necessarily on autopilot, which I think a lot of times, especially this day and age with technology, a lot of us tend to be like in a trance, you know, reactive. Well, that's a really, I've never heard anybody say that, and you were so right on. That is such a brilliant thing to say. It's it's really a great observation because it's absolutely true. Yeah. Well, you know, you got to think about it this way. You know, long before we had television and radio and all these great little things like the Internet and laptops and all this nonsense everybody seemed to be distracted with, is that we were at a time where we sat around campfires and you had the kerosene lanterns and you had the moon and the stars and, of course, the storms and all that other, but you were you were part of it. You were in it. There it was. It was the experience. And so you got to see and sense and know, especially naturally, things like weather patterns, as, as you were talking about in your book uh, with the Four Seasons. Mm-hmm. And you see today that we've disconnected from all of that. And because of that, even in the rhythm of language, just simply talking with someone, you see a big disconnect. And now we're throwing out acronyms and, you know, LOL and all this other kind of nonsense. And you think, you know, how good could this possibly be for us? I would think it would almost accelerate the aging process in many ways that is very unnatural. <laughs> accelerate the aging mm. and accelerate the uh, the stupidity, I think, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I actually had to e- e-chat somebody one time, what does the LOL stand for? Oh, yeah. laugh out loud. Yeah. Okay, well, why don't you just do ha-ha? That's what we used to do, and that's what people naturally do. They don't go LOL in front yes. of you. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and not only that, but with texting so much, People really, between emails and texting, people really don't want to talk on the phone as much. They don't want to hear the person's voice. They don't want to see them in person. I mean, people love to see each other in person, but they seem to love hiding behind, um, you know, any sort of real connection. And I, I find that to be a little disturbing, and only because I get tired of texting so much. And I do mm-hmm. text a lot, only because... You know, my kids like to text, and then all of us have kind of gotten used to it. It is handy for certain situations, mm-hmm. but I found that it, it's hard for me to hold a conversation that way, and it gets to be ridiculous. Well, I've never texted, so I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in the world. I'm in the world of, with it for sure. Yeah. You know, I was just thinking as you were describing things about, you know, how there'll be times that you're supposed to gung-ho and you get into your business or your work, and then it flourishes, things are all just ticking, and then, other moments you pull back and you rest, and I was just thinking as you were describing all of that, as I was talking with someone and having been to France myself and experiencing this, is they really believe in that still. You know, Europe really still does the idea of the rhythm. You know, you go to work in the morning, Mm -hmm. and then at noontime you shut down for a few hours and you Mm -hmm. take a nap, and then you relax, and then later on you go back, do a little bit more work, and then after that... You know, and the day is yours, and you see this, and and it's been working, whereas we tend to, here in America, push through everything has to get done, and if it means we don't even eat lunch for a half hour, we're going to do that. And then you wonder why sometimes success just eludes so many people when it comes to achieving their goals and their dreams, and that could be one of those things, just forcing and pushing it too much rather than following the natural flow of things. Yeah, that's beautifully put. I agree. And and I think, um, you know, the more that we sit up with artificial lighting, the more that we sit at the computer screen late into the night, all of that kind of stuff, it, it, it messes with our signals. And I'm sure, I mean, our bodies are so amazing. Our, our brains are um, such powerful computers, and I know that it adjusts to a certain extent. But ultimately, it cannot be healthy. And I do think it accelerates the aging and the stress process. Yeah. 
Now, how is the best way when somebody gets this book uh, for them to use it? Do they just dive right in from page one through? Or because as I've noticed, I can skip around to different things and they seem to stand on their own. Yeah, thank you. Yes, it can be one or the other. Um, uh, for sure, they could just jump in, open the pages, and start reading something and see see what jumps out at them. It's meant to be read from the beginning to the end, but I also have a page in there that says you can read this a variety of ways. And it is a color-coded book. So if someone wants to just get in and read about these four phases, the resting, building, expression, and deconstructing phase, um, which I call week one, week two, week three, week, week four, or fall, winter, spring, and summer, um, then they can, they can go to the color-coded pages and look at them that way. And by the way, let me just say really quickly, if we don't get a chance to dive into these four weeks, they can go to my website and pick up a free poster that maps out these four phases for them. It's a free download. And uh, they'd either have to print it out or just have it on their computer, but it would give them a chance to take a look at that as well. Interesting, interesting stuff. Now, this book was written for all women, right? It was written for all women because of what I discovered is that this is an, this, this four-phase um, blueprint is really an imprint that we have from the time we're born until the time we die. But it surfaces during our reproductive years when, we're, when we are um, able to have children to show us the, the manifestation of it, of it the, to show us the blueprint of the whole thing. But I have found that it, um, again, like I was saying before, that once we hit <clears throat> menopause, this rhythm does not go away. We no longer produce children, but we are able to uh, produce circles and lead nations uh, stronger than ever. Our bodies have been doing this rhythm for so long, we don't lose that rhythm. And the only reason why we think we do is because society tells us that we're finished at menopause. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, uh, it's just absolutely not true. And it was actually an 80-year-old friend of mine who first um, had me really looking at this because she said, I knew I still had a rhythm. She was telling me, I know I still have this rhythm. And then I started surveying a lot of friends and associates, and there are quite a few women who um, still track their, their energies um, well beyond their menopause years, or they just notice it, they feel it, they, they completely feel this rhythm. And now that I have women tracking, I have them track by the first day of the new moon, I have them follow the moon cycle, um, they, they just can't believe how accurate it is. They, they just can't believe it. Yeah. Well, Don, they're going to have to start to because it's yeah. been going on for a few billion years. <laughs> yes, it has. Yes, it has. Well, they, you know, everyone has, has just really thought that, that it was just for cycling women. And for sure it's easy to identify if you're a cycling woman because you'd start tracking on the first day of your period. Mm -hmm. um, and, they're, and you ovulate and, unless you're on uh, the birth control pill or anything. But, um, uh, but still... You know, cycling women. Um, uh, you know, we can really see the markers in this in this cycle of ours. But but the but the rhythm itself doesn't go away. We don't turn into men at menopause. Our bodies mm -hmm. are set up as females, and our, our 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 human bodies are just amazing. And there's just so much we don't understand. And I think that over in, in time, you know, we'll understand more and more. Of course. Now, as you brought up PMS, that's certainly one of those big jokes that are out there a lot of times. Well, you know, she's PMSing again, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and bring that up to the forefront here for our male listeners out there, and there's a lot of them there, I see them, mm -hmm. is how do you suggest to men to, I guess, roll with the punches, for lack of a better word, when their partner is in the PMS cycle? Well, first of all, I do have in the book itself. I have what I call a man guide. At the end of these, at the end of these, does it come with a man bag, or it's just the man guide itself? <laughs> it's just, it's okay. just, they, they'd have to get their own bag with <laughs> the book, yeah, you know, that kind of thing, their own purse. But um, for sure, I talk to the men about each of these phases because when they really understand these rhythmic phases, they finally get that fourth week. And I get rid of the idea of PMS altogether because um, unless a woman is really, really suffering with some bad symptoms. Um, otherwise, it's not a syndrome at all. Uh, and the easiest way for me to explain it to, would be to be able to go through the four phases quickly and show the men how they fit into each of those. 
Yes, please. Okay. So w- what we have here is, is what, we, what you have to keep in mind is that my work is really about showing how one week prepares for the next. Again, we've got that uterine nest that's building and then deconstructs. This is one complete cycle. It's not separate, you know, these phases aren't separate and independent of each other. One week prepares for the next. So that first week what happens is the resting phase. I identify it with fall because you can think of it like red leaves falling from trees. Um, it's harvest time. It's like the fall in that way. It's, it's ending a former cycle, and that's exactly what's happening with the women. Right here in that first week um, for the cycling women, this is the day that the first day of it is when they would be starting their period. So they're shedding that uterine lining from the former cycle. And what happens is that our hormones biologically, scientifically, are at their lowest. And what this is telling us to do in a practical sense is to lay low. We need to be resting during this time. And women are not resting enough. And when women are not resting, it's no different than you or I not sleeping at night. Um, you know, and I don't know about you, but um, for me to lose a night of sleep, it had better be a good party, you know. Right. And, and if I lose two nights of sleep, forget it. You know, I'm, a, I'm just trashed. I'm trashed for days. And it, it, it just sets, it just would set me up in a very bad way. So when women aren't sleeping, when they aren't resting during this time, it's setting up the rest of their month in a as a disadvantage. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't go to work. It doesn't mean that they can't run the marathon that they've already scheduled to do. You know, they're not ill, although they might not feel all that well. But what it means is that it's it's time to be mindful. After work, do not stop and do that extra errand. Um, after the marathon, don't go out for pizza and beer. It's really time to be resting and knowing where you're at. And what our male partners can do, well, what our partners in general, um, I just let me just throw in for those who have female partners, women who have mm-hmm. female partners, don't really have the same challenges um, that, that the, the straight women have who have male partners because the women who have women partners already understand the vulnerability of having a cycle. Right. And, you know, but, but the women with the male <clears throat> partners have partners who don't understand and the best thing that a guy can do during this time is to encourage the woman in his life to relax and take it easy. And for him to make dinner or bring dinner home or take care of the kids, really encourage her to rest. And, um, you know, well, geez, we Suzanne, time, I guess I can understand why I can't experience that rage of PMS that everybody's joking about with my own wife because. I cook all the time. Yeah, well, see, that's a good, that's, a, that's an excellent thing. I, I don't think, even see it happening. You know, I've always, I've always had men, I've always had men in my life who cook. I love that. And, uh, um, but, the, but we're talking about the first week here. We're not talking about PMS right. here. You I know, know I'm running, yeah. I'm running way ahead of the game. I'm ready to solve the problem. That's what men do. Yeah. Okay. Well, so here's the thing: is the, the solving the problem starts with the first week. Okay. Solving the problem starts with the first week, the second week, and the third week. But solving the problem doesn't happen in the fourth week. So uh, the problem of the fourth week doesn't get solved in the fourth week. That's the that's the key to this whole thing. Mm-hmm. So it it really has to build. It has to have these stepping stones. And when you encourage your wife, uh, the woman in your life, to rest, that is the beginning. That's such a great aphrodisiac for her. You know, this is a very sexy thing. And so if you're just rubbing her feet, if you're sleeping skin to skin, if you're just watching movies together, follow her lead sexually, you know, sexually um, during that time and not push for more. Just make it a super sweet time you're going to find that she just loves you even more. It's just fantastic. And I can't tell you, you've you've got to remember as men that women are rhythmically sexual. They have a rhythmic sex drive. That's what this cycle is about. And when you can get in sync with that, you can co-create the relationship you've always desired. Because women do like variety sexually. They don't have this steady burn going on um, where they want the same thing all the time because their body doesn't want the same thing all the time. Mm-hmm. But every every bit of this can be very sexual to women and very much a turn on. But you have to get into in sync with the energy of what's happening. If you go against the grain, you're not going to have a happy camper. Mm-hmm. Um, so that first week, that's what's happening. The second week is the time when scientifically, her hormones in a super broad general sense are going from zero to 100. This is the week that her uterine lining is building. And what that means is that this is the building phase. 
what she's doing here is she's building her relationship. She's building her business. She loves everybody. Estrogen and testosterone are starting to build, and these are um, these cause her to um, really want to connect with everyone. And primarily, what this means is that she's trying to attract a mate. And this is what's going on beneath the surface, with or without her. So what happens here is that women become a little sexually intoxicated during this week. And this is a very good time. I tell the men that you really must clear your calendars and go on dates. This is the time to um, go out and have fun. This is the time to engage in heart-to-heart talks. Um, This is the time to be super romantic. If If you've been sweet the first week and encouraged her to rest, now you ask her out on dates and um, really court her, this is, um, this is how you build your relationship. This is how you create a great relationship. And you get into, as long as you've got contraception in place, if you don't want a pregnancy, then this is the time that you, you just turn on your best lovemaking skills. Mm-hmm. Um, and you devote yourself to her and only her. When you get into that third week, and that's and and um and that week would also identify with the um I call that winter. It's like you see a mountain where you're you start at the bottom and you climb to the top. That's what that's like. And it's it also equates to the waxing moon. It's a building of the light, building of the moon. Mm-hmm. So the third week you'd equate to the full moon. The the first day of it starts with ovulation. And ovulation is the queen bee of the entire operation. I mean, you know, it's the reason those other 27 days happen. Ovulation is um, the most primal and the most spiritual thing that happens in the universe as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're talking about um, an egg dropping down and possibly a sperm and an egg coming together. That we're not, we're not just talking, you know, primal. We're talking primordial stuff happening here, and we're also talking about the most spiritual thing that could possibly happen. So you've got this amazing um, Earth Spirit alignment going on, and what happens um, uh, for the woman here is that she is just in her full goddess mode. I mean, in that second week, along with building her relationships, she's also scientifically growing in beauty because she's really attracting that partner. So by the time she gets to ovulation, I mean, you know, you've got the, the most glorious woman on the planet as far as how she's feeling, how she's looking, and all of that kind of stuff. No different than how we feel about the full moon when we see it. And this is if, this is if things are going well for her. This is if she has the cooperation of her partner. This is if her, she's got direction and she's able to build her life in this way. This is something that for women, they have to track over and over again and, and really get in sync with. It can take many cycles before they start getting in alignment with what that primal engine is actually doing. Um, this could be a very depressing time for a woman when it should be at her height, but it, she could be very depressed because maybe she has no direction and, and her primal body wants her to have direction. Maybe she wants to attract a mate and she's not attracting the right mate. Maybe she's with a mate and it's not the right one. You know, I mean, all these things could be going on. She thinks she's depressed for some other reason, mm-hmm. but really she's kind of going against the grain here of what her natural rhythm is, what her primal um, body is actually doing. And, you know, again, we've got this perfect alignment of this primal body, and we've got an amazing mind that helps us to evaluate what's appropriate to to do, what's appropriate to act on, and what's not, you know, that kind of thing, to be able to make decisions that way. Mm. You know, it's just just perfect. I mean, um, as we go through the rest of that third week, that third phase, Oh, and so during ovulation, sexually, I mean, we'll talk to talk to the guys here, and I and I I like to talk to the guys about the 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 sexual connection because I feel like that that's their in, that's the place where they understand how they fit in, and from there they seem to understand how then um, by by being in alignment with this that they can again co-create the relationship that they'd like. So during ovulation, again, as long as contraception is in place, if you don't want a pregnancy, then this is the time to kind of get raw and primal. You know, this is the, the time to kind of get down and dirty, if you will. I mean, you know, cr- try some ridiculous things that make you laugh, you know, something you've mm-hmm. never tried before. Because it's just kind of the time to do it. This is the time when, she, when her body is most receptive. Her body is in this full-on expression mode. For all of us, it's a, it's a, it's a moment of truth. For her, it's really this moment of truth of who is she really showing up 
in her authenticity, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Is she showing up with the person that she wants to be showing up with? All of that kind of thing. And then as we go on through that week, ovulation is over with, and then the body has to figure out whether it's, uh, it takes a few days to figure out whether it's pregnant or not. So in that time, for, for a couple, it's, she's still sitting high on her throne with her hormones. And so it's kind of sort of this king and queen mode of sort of looking out over the land and knowing how to, how to uh, take care of business. And, and really it's a perfect time for mind-to-mind talks between couples. It's a time to talk about the kids or your money or where you're living or how are the jobs going, you know, all of that. It's just a, it's just a beautiful balance Mm-hmm. Um, for people to really optimize, um, um, uh, capitalize on that, let's say. And again, any of these things can happen during any time of the month, of course. It's just that we're talking about the optimal times. Mm-hmm. Other times you're kind of pulling in tools. Mm. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. Four Seasons and Four Weeks is the title of the book, and our guest today joining us is Anne McQueen. Is there a website our listeners can go to where they can find out more about this? Yes, they can go to 4s4w.com. Uh, this, the book is Four Seasons in Four Weeks, right? And they should pick up that poster that shows them the four phases. Very good. I want to thank you so much for joining us here on the program today. You know, again, it's been a juicy week of approaching the female way of looking and expressing things. <laughs> yeah. thank Thanks for so being much. on the program. Thank you so much for having me today. You bet. Thank you to the listeners out there for tuning in. I want to remind you, it's four seasons in four weeks. Definitely find out what your rhythms can be. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.